Lewis, our second case is disturbing on so many levels. A young woman in Milwaukee who stands accused of killing her alleged sex trafficker and abuser is out on bail, a $400,000 bail, because the community raised the money to get her out while she awaits trial. 19-year-old Crystal Kaiser is charged with first-degree murder and arson. Now, she was 17 years old in June of 2018 when she allegedly shot a man who appeared to be pimping her out to other child abusers, and she wasn't the only one that he was allegedly doing this with. She shot him twice in the head. Then she set the house on fire, and she took off in his BMW, according to police. Crystal was 16 when she met 33-year-old Randy Villar in the fall of 2017. Randy Villar preyed on underage black girls. That was what he was into. He liked to videotape sex with them. This is with his victims. He not only had a lot of child porn, he made his own child porn. And this is all information that we have gotten from the police. And police say that they found at least a dozen victims in addition to Crystal. Correct. They met on a trafficking website, which is no longer in existence. Crystal reportedly admitted saying she wanted extra money. She was having trouble at home and someone suggested this website. She went on there. She connected with Randy and she and this is a story that she told to the Washington Post reporter. And it's a wonderfully detailed story because he visited her or she visited him. Uh, excuse me. The visits went on um, several times and that that's when Crystal told a lot of the details. So Crystal said that at first uh, he was very nice and very complimentary and that he would take her out on dates and that uh, he would order her steaks and that he would buy her gifts, even gave her a little heart locket. What is he doing here? He's grooming her. He's absolutely grooming her for his in initial intention. Uh, and that's that's par for the course in these type of trafficking cases. He spotted her. He was a predator. Uh, that website, I really don't want to mention the name of it because it doesn't exist anymore, was famous and I think was ultimately responsible for that reason to under layer dark layer that they had at, at those type of average that type of advertisement and that the trafficking industry used that site more than any other site so and he took her shopping and he bought her clothes right. let her drive his cars as you said building trust building trust and grooming her, right? Now, she, of course, said that she knew at some point, right, they were going to be having sex. That was the whole point. But the fact was he was so nice to her, right? So it wasn't right. just about that. It's that he cared about her. Sure, he cared about her so much that he abused her. And then he sold her as a prostitute to other men because there were all these room keys that the authorities found in his house. And he would set up um, these encounters for Crystal and the other girls he had through that website and right. other like-minded creepy people right. would show up right. and then he'd split some of the money. I don't, can't even say split. He would share some of the money with the girls that he was pimping out. Right. Oh, it's just disgusting. Now, Crystal said that she didn't want to do it anymore. She did it for a while. She didn't want to do it anymore, but he kept threatening her. So the relationship now is changing from buying you sweet things to I'm controlling you and you're going to do as I say, and you're going to make money for me. And you're also, you know, going to let me get off on you really. Correct. So um, this part of the story for me gets a little fuzzy here. It's about how Crystal ended up at his house that night. She says that she had a fight with her boyfriend and that she contacted Randy. Randy ordered an Uber to go pick her up and and take her back to his house. Now, if he's the creepy guy that's bothering me, I don't think I would turn to him. But then again, this is all part of that mental anguish that the abuser uses to control their victims as if, come to me, baby, because I'm going to save you. Correct. And that probably is not the first time that she had a, 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 an incident or an event where the only comfort or safety she felt she could find was reaching out to Villar. So um, she goes to his house and they watch TV, they eat pizza, they get high. And then she says that he starts um, 
attacking her, trying to have uh, sexually assaulting her, and she doesn't want it, so she fights back and she shoots him in the head. Right. She, she actually, shoot- she actually, I actually read that uh, he had straddled her on the ground and was trying to remove her pants prior to right and those two shots. Shot him twice in the head. Yes, and then she sets the house on fire and she takes off in his BMW. And this is where the authorities say that it was really premeditated because she had the gun with her when she went over there. She had planned to do this the whole time is what they said. Now, the authorities are not denying that he abused her and that she was traumatized by him. That does not seem to be in dispute at all. What is in dispute is whether it was um, a crime that happened because she was defending herself, which is what she says, or whether it was premeditated. She went there with the intention of killing him. Right. Uh, apparently, she had told her boyfriend uh, uh, of the problem she was having with Millar. And her boyfriend had given her that handgun previously and said, you need to start carrying this to protect yourself. So that's a, allegedly how it came into her possession, not to kill somebody that night specifically uh, premeditated. So I, it, uh, I don't know. Uh, the DA is claiming that that's where he's the basis of his uh, uh, premeditated homicide is coming. So the first degree, which carries a life sentence, uh, it's it's a big thing here. And I, uh, versus um, in the heat of in the heat of passion, or, uh, where I think she's looking at a, a lesser degree charge, where she's looking at 15 years versus life. Now she says that she took the car because he had promised her on her 18th birthday that he was going to give her a car. That was her justification. That's what she said. Now, after the fire, because police responded immediately to the fire, and that's when they found all these hotel room keys, and then they they found the credit card statement for the Uber. So then the cops track down the Uber driver, and the Uber driver tells the cops, oh, yeah, I dropped off a petite black girl, um, and her name was Crystal. So cops immediately are already, and there's a backstory we're going to tell everybody about how this guy was already under investigation as a sexual mm-hmm. predator and how the system completely failed. Absolutely we're going to get to that failed. in a second. Right. But I, I want to set up the crystal part of this, and then we're going to give you the backstory and the context as to why this is such such a complex case as far as fault here. Um, so she takes off in his car, and then... At 3 a.m., she posts a selfie, and the selfie, the curtains in the back match Randy's house. Okay, so that puts her there at the scene of the crime. Then a few days later, she goes on Facebook, and she's streaming live, and she's telling everyone that she gave her brother a BMW Mm. car car that was stolen from the scene, and then she's showing off the gun. Right. Back to that selfie, uh, that catch team metadata on that selfie show, that picture was taken after uh, Mr. Villar's deceased body was located. So got to love those catch teams. Yep. So uh, the next morning, the police arrest her at her boyfriend's house, and ultimately she admits to police. She gives them various stories, but she ultimately admits to police that she did kill Randy because she was defending herself, and bail was set at $1 million for her. Now, prosecutors, again, say that it was absolutely premeditated. So that is Crystal's version, right, of how she met him, how she got involved, and what happened. Now, let's take a look at the abuser and how police let this serial sex abuser get away from them. Because this, to me is an equally heinous crime, the fact that the cops let him go. All right, let's go back in time to February 2018. Four months before Randy is murdered, a 15-year-old girl calls 911, and she tells the 911 operator that a man has given her drugs, that he's going to kill her, and then the girl hangs up. So, of course, the police know where the phone call came from, and they go to the house. When, dis, when, when the cops get to the house, they find a woman walking outside. Now, when I say a woman, I'm using that loosely. She's 15 years old. She's walking outside. She's wearing a bra and a jacket over her bra and isn't zipped up. It is February in the greater Milwaukee area. That is freaking cold. Cold, okay? So 
She, the, the cops talk to her. She tells them, according to the police report, that she met him through this website, the very same website where he met Crystal. And of course, it's a prostitution website, a trafficking website. And as you said, it's been shut down. The girl said that she met him when she was 14 years old, that he paid her $250 for sex the first time. And then each time afterwards, it was $100. The girl had run away from home and she had moved in with Randy. And the police said in the report that the girl was identified and described as prostituting herself as if, Lewis, it was all her fault. And they're just dealing with a runaway prostitute. And let's not bother. Right. Let's not bother the the, the man in the house. Right. OK. Right. So, victim blaming. I mean, we hear that all the time. Victim blaming. But when it comes to law enforcement, it, it hurts more. Oh, yeah. Well, especially when you realize what in the world was going on there. Now, I will say right. this. The police did go back, right? They right. went back with a search warrant and they did arrest him and they removed uh, computers, laptops, uh, memory cards, hard drives from the house. So right. that was the right thing to do. And that is you're talking about the February 2018. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. it's in interesting the da because he was getting so much flack because they released voler they did they not released keep, him they That's... absolutely released him and he got so much flack the da felt it necessary they had to post something on social media to address that i want to read you the small glimpse of uh, what he posted as district attorney i cannot condone vigilante justice and when presented with evidence of premeditated murder i do not believe it is appropriate for prosecutors to weigh the value of the victim's life. I don't understand this statement. <laughs> which, who's, so, there are so many victims here. Who's, whose life, who's, which victim are we placing a value on? First of all, <laughs> all human life has value. Absolutely. There, there, there's absolutely no question there. And no, no one is supporting vigilante justice. However, I'm sorry, the police and the prosecutors do not have clean hands here. They do not have clean hands here because they let him walk out the door after being arrested. They did not set any form of bail. They just said, just come back for a court right. date. Who yeah, does that? that? Who does that when you have a 15 year old girl walking around half naked, you know, and, and she tells the cops that he found her on that website. Right. Uh, uh, what right. more do you need? Yeah, it, you know, we, we see this way too often in these type of investigations where in this DA Gravely, Paris, the same thing we've heard many other times is that they didn't make the arrest because they were trying to put together a better case. Well, they wanted the case to stick. This okay, case, I hear you. They said that they had to go through yeah. what was on the computers and they had to try and identify the girls. No one is arguing that they had to do more work and do the forensics. But what is absolutely clear is he was arrested and no bail was set. Absolutely. I'll take it a step further than that. In February of 2018, when they found those videos and those pictures of underage girls, one of them being uh, Crystal, Crystal, Crystal uh, they had more than enough to affect an arrest and keep this man in custody at that point. They knew he was a predator and yet he had multiple victims who were underage. They had more than enough to keep him in custody. Right. They didn't Over. need they didn't need to know at that very moment yeah. exactly who every girl was. They, all they needed to know was he was a sexual predator or at least suspected and should be held behind bars away from kids. This DA's out that he tried and he talked about on social media said that his the police referred charges against Volar to his office on May 24th, 2018, 12 days before his death. So uh, by that time, almost four months had passed by. What did they do in those four months to protect the public, any child that was around Volar from being victimized from him again? Any victims during that time frame is on the shoulders of this guy for oh. not taking the action to protect this child and every child he was in contact with. They're we absolutely, see this so often. They're absolutely responsible without question. I will hear nothing other than that. But I am curious about your perspective, because what a lot of people may not know is that you work with an organization. Uh, we'll continue telling the backstory here, but you may want to let people know what kind of work you do with PAVE and what PAVE is. PAVE is a national uh, organization. It's one of the largest in the nation that deals specifically with uh, uh, victims of sexual assault. 
and we deal a lot with uh, victims who are underage. We do a lot of work, not just with PAVE on a national level, but with another organization called Children of the Night. Children of the Night has been around for 40 years. And please remind me, I want to make sure there's a link to that in this episode, um, where they are the only organization nationally where you can call 24-7 and they will make sure you're picked up from whatever location you don't want to be at and put you on the path to getting yourself in a safe place and healed. That's their priority. They've been around for 40 plus years and they have saved over 10,000 victims. So Mm. they're out there. I don't know if she attempted to make or she was aware of this type of uh, organizations uh, that they exist. Uh, But yeah, so when I hear this kind of stuff, yes, I take it very personal because we deal with it on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's very frustrating. It is. It, it really is. And in, in this case, you know, the police have the opportunity to save children and to put a predator away. Now, um, let's go back to the fact that he gets arrested, right? right? He gets released, no bail whatsoever. And he continues conducting his way of life, which is basically looking for girls underage, had a thing for young black girls. Um, and what is... As the police are going through the videos, you know, at this time period that they say that they were actually going through the videos that were confiscated uh, on the homemade child porn videos where he is using the girls that he has met on this website that are hanging out at his house or living with him. uh, Apparently, you can hear on the videotapes, you can hear him say that he is an escort trainer and that he is instructing the girls on how to be a better prostitute. And the authorities themselves say that those girls looked like they were between the ages of 12 and 14 years old. Even though they didn't have IDs on the girls, they could tell by their bodies how old they were. So this again, I mean, I I, I keep saying it over and over again, but it, it just undoes me. So he gets released. He continues doing his dirty deeds. And then by June, he's dead. Crystal has pulled the trigger and shot him and put an end to him. I am not defending her, but what I am saying is that if this happened, you cannot remove the prosecutors and the police from the responsibility of what happened in that house. You absolutely can't. So, Lewis, I want to talk more about Randy, and here's what we know about him. He lived alone in this tiny one-bedroom house, um, apparently Once they did the autopsy, they realized he had some missing fingers and toes. He was born that way. One leg was shorter than the other. And he had a lot of money. Police say that they found a bank account with $800,000 in it. And when they talked with bank officials, the bank said to the police, and this is what's so interesting, the bank didn't know that he had been killed, but the bank was getting ready to contact the police or had contacted the police because of suspicious activity in his account. The bank said, yeah. right, that was consistent with human trafficking or mm. some kind of illegal activity. The bank said that so much money in cash was being moved in and out of his account that at one time it swelled up to one point five million dollars. And this right. is a man who was essentially unemployed. Right. There's a very high probability that Randall was working for somebody else and that move that he was getting part of that money and moving it forward to the person that he was reporting to. Look, uh, sex trafficking is a worldwide multi-billion national organization, but organization. They the money they make and what they will go to to protect their assets. There's nothing they won't do to keep themselves anonymous here. So the fear that Crystal felt here in dealing with him was well validated. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, she carrying a gun to protect herself uh, in case she had a potential run in with Randall. I, I completely get it. I bet she's still she's in hiding right now from what I read. She's not uh, she's being very careful who she associates with. And that's part of the organization of uh, what they do when they build her out. They're keeping her in a safe place. Um, there's a lot of money at stake here. It's it, yes. And I'm sure that there's plenty of information on all of the computers, the hard drives, the memory, everything that they confiscated has a lot of information, including the bank can provide a lot of information. Now, the prosecutor said that the reason he had so much money, it's almost as if they're defending him, is that he made a lot of money in cryptocurrency. And that may be possible that he traded cryptocurrency and made money. That's that's very possible. 
Yeah, I'd like to see his taxes. We'll see how that goes. But the yeah. fact that there's so much money and it's in the bank, the bank got involved, goes to another thing we say. I've seen it way too often on these cases, right? But it, to me, it just screams the potential of a conflict here. I, I think there's a... Conflict? I'm going to say a crime. Uh, well, not a conflict of interest. I don't know if this DA's office should be investigating this crime. I, I just think they've dropped the ball. They've been inept in the investigation. And now they're in a sort of a self-defense mode, especially that uh, statement I read from the DA himself. And, well, let's take it one step yeah. further here. Right. Really, l- let's look at this. He is a white man who had a lot of money in the bank. Right. And he, and then these are the stories of young, poor black girls. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, but it appears to me that the judicial system took the word of the white man who ends up being the predator in this case and the, and a true criminal against the victims who were young black girls. And that to me is so revolting. And I think that is why he walked out the door and the cops didn't do anything. Right. And that is exactly what needs to be investigated by another yes. agency. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, his father, Randy's father, says, you know, his son was a great guy, didn't do anything wrong. You know, I'm sorry that he's lost his son. But take a look at some of these videotapes because those girls are someone's daughters. So I'm sorry. Son, son did do something. And now there's this further complication in her case, which may actually help her in her defense. As a victim of sex trafficking... The state of Wisconsin um, has something that's called the affirmative defense in which if she can establish during the trial that she was being victimized as a victim of sex trafficking at the time that the crime occurred, she may very well be acquitted. But from what I've read, that has never been um, tested before in such a serious crime. It's usually used in uh, lesser crimes, and this is a murder case. What What do you think, Lewis? Right. I think it's the perfect case to test it. Uh, let's, let's, let's use it. That's what it's there for. And the DA is fighting that affirmative defense with the response that it is not an affirmative defense because it was premeditated. It's going back to that. So he's putting a lot of weight into the fact that he believes this is a premeditated murder um, to protect this from being an affirmative defense. Can someone explain to me why her bail was set at $1 million when she doesn't have the assets to get out anyway, but why $1 million? Right. I, I would, I don't think that's the, obviously that's not the standard bail for something like this. So there must've been some type of bail enhancement written a motion to increase her bail. It would be interesting what the DA included in that to, to get that to happen. Yeah, it's really, I've covered um, murder cases in Wisconsin, and I've spent a lot of time at a woman's prison in Fond du Lac. It's one of the major prisons in Wisconsin, working with a young woman who um, killed her parents. She murdered them. She was being abused by them. She admitted um, she took a plea deal, and um, she's going to be serving something like 23 years behind bars. And, And the thing about Wisconsin is, when I was researching that case, one of the captains said to me, you know, you ha- you cannot allow, even though you have been a victim, you cannot allow people to kill other people. I'll never forget her quote. She said to me, if we allowed every child who had been abused by a parent to murder their parents, she said, we'd have a lot of dead parents. Probably and that would. has stuck with me because I understand we're talking about justice. You can't just go around murdering people. I get that. I am not defending Crystal. But what I am saying is what happened to Crystal did not happen um, without so many other factors. So many factors. And the biggest one, the justice system failed, right? It pretty much left her no choice. Um, because and, and if look- they had removed him then he would not have been able to continue to abuse her. Therefore, right. those two would it have starts, been separated. It starts a very ugly snowball. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's no return. But you do have the right to defend yourself. Back to that very basic concept. Since she was in the middle of being sexually assaulted, she has the right to use whatever means necessary, reasonable, to defend herself. And if it happened as if uh, it, it was stated that he was on top of her, trying to rip her pants down, she was within her rights. Yeah. 
What a horrible case. I, we're going to be following this one because it could be a test case for so many others. Yeah. So we'll see.